actually grab the, the mic by hand in order to optimize the context switch. And uh, let's do a bit of rehearsal first. What does this mean? Yes. What does that mean? Okay. You're, dead. you're okay? No, you're dead. Yeah. So first, first in line is Mark. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So there we go. So I'm going to give a little report on using uh, ABCL, uh, Armbar Common Lisp, which is a Common Lisp implementation that runs in the JVM. Uh, this was a uh, so the purpose of this talk is twofold. ABCL is used in production to give a little testimony towards that, and then some of the uh, a little bit of a talk about some of the issues about what it took to actually uh, uh, bring it into production in terms of uh, operations environment with people who didn't know anything about Lisp. So this was a project uh, done at the University of Buffalo School of Dental Medicine. It's a, a, a it's a dental clinic with students and uh, dentists. Uh, it's it, and they have an electronic health record system which they've developed in house. And the subtlety here is when a student does dental work, they actually need it signed off by the uh, by the dentist in order to be approved. So the the system existing was called Picasso, and we developed something called Pablo, and it had basically two goals as a system. It was a brownfield project as opposed to greenfield in the sense we had to bring it up at the same time as the existing system was in, in place. And the twofold things was to move to an HTML5 client, and the second is to use RDF uh, OWL uh, semantic technologies to describe the data. More flexibility would be enabled uh, there and to do research across the data sets because it's essentially a denormalized form. And then the other problem in the United States is you have a lot of different kind of uh, people with different uh, uh, silos of medical data to allow one to transfer between them. So the this is uh, so the system was illithid. Uh, it's essentially a REST broker uh, used QuickLisp about uh, 60 ASDF systems. Had to use uh, Java libraries. It's one of the advantages of ABCL. Uh, and then the big reason why this was done with ABCL is there's a lot of uh, semantic web reasoners written in Java. Uh, we worked with Alan Ruttenberg, misspelled, he has two T's, sorry about that, with a system called LSW2. Just put it just click, just like that, okay, if people can hear me. Uh, which is based in Java that would have to be packaged into this thing at, at runtime. Uh, the RDF store we used was uh, Ontotex GraphDB, and the legacy system was using the Microsoft SQL Server. So here's a little bit of a systems architecture. Here on the left, you can see the client, which is an HTML5 browser. It goes through the middle, which is, this is an early diagram of the architecture, but uh, co components within the system uh, corresponding to the SDF systems. And then over here on the, uh, uh, the, the right side, you have the classical persistence for the system, which is going through the middle tier. Top one is the RDF triple store. Uh, second one is a file system where the scan artifacts, the documents were, were, were placed. And the third is the SQL server. So uh, what, is, what is the problem with deploying? Uh, so the basic case is that the operators didn't want to know anything about Lisp. They had to be able to start and stop, uh, manage the systems, uh, maybe change configuration of deployment descriptors at the time. So the solution we came up with was to use a, a Java servlet container and get ABCL packaged in a single uh, binary artifact that they can just deploy like any other application they had. Uh, so in order to do this, there's a piece of code called ABCL servlet, which is open source, which is a scaffolding for a Java servlet that just brings up the Java runtime uh, as, as part of the initialization process in the servlet uh, container. Uh, uh, all software was encapsulated by ASDF. ABCL is a spe special syntax by which uh, artifacts, uh, Java artifacts, uh, can be referred by this syntax, and they're downloaded once at runtime and cached by, by Maven. So these, this is essentially a kind of a URI for Java artifacts that pulls down a definite version from the from the from the uh, uh, internet. And the second problem was that we had to actually locate the ASDF systems within the, uh, the deployment artifact that we're putting. So based, the problem with ASDF is it doesn't describe all its resources. It doesn't have to. There are runtime effects and so forth like that. So we're, if you were, the single assumption is that every ASDF uh, file is in the root of the file system, you can locate that on the file system, and then you recursively copy all of that over to your deployment artifact. So that's the solution. So the solution was a 180, 108 megabyte WAR. So a lot of things were packaged into the thing, but you know, space is cheap these days, and it, it worked out. 
And uh, the bonus that we got here is I was able to, it's running on Windows in, a, in an environment that I didn't touch, but I told him to keep a port open and I opened a Swank server so I could actually connect to Emacs with the server was running to connect information and patched and diagnosed a few things that was going on. So, success. Thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about uh, okay, uh, about one of the common problems uh, that uh, especially outsiders and newcomers to Common Lisp face. Yeah, there are, there's actually a, a whole list of common problems. So, some of them I have crossed out because of the things that we know, like Greek Lisp and other things. But there's still one problem that you uh, often encounter that uh, people from other coming from other languages like. Python, Koja, Haskell, etc. will uh, say that Lisp has uh, poor names, it's inc inconsistent standard, and, and stuff like that, and things like that. And uh, basically, this is uh, this is an important problem. Why? Because uh, because the language is a medium of communication, and to, to, for communication to be effective, uh, we need to have uh, to make it understandable. Uh, so it's not not a known problem. Uh, and so uh, this uh, actually partially uh, informed many projects uh, that appeared over the lifetime of Lisp standard, which is almost 30 years now, right, to like, modernization efforts of the language. Uh, most of them uh, failed or succeeded only partially. Like, uh, for instance, CDR is an important project, but uh, it didn't have a, a great impact. Why? Uh, because uh, like most of, of these projects uh, they want to like, build everything uh, anew, or part of it anew. Yeah. They don't preserve backward compatibility, and for our community, which is rather small and uh, which values evolution, uh, it's not uh, a path forward. Right? So another approach to this was uh, creating different utility libraries, yeah, and there are uh, quite a few of them. Uh, so, and there are two, two kinds of utility libraries. One's, uh, one uh, kind is like general purpose utility libraries, and the other kind is special things like uh, anaphoric utilities or meta bind bind or other things like that, which implement some specific particular uh, uh, improvement to the common Lisp uh, language, so to say. But both of these, uh, they fall short uh, of uh, reaching this goal of uh, language evolution because either they are uh, just uh, specific or they don't go far enough. And um, so I also uh, played part in this uh, utility madness, so to say. Uh, and maybe almost 10 years ago, I started a project which was called uh, Reasonable Utilities at the time. Uh, that tried to do the same, like evolve the language up to my needs and implement the things that were missing, like, uh, like better work uh, with standard uh, data structures like hash tables, strings, and so on. Uh, and it evolved over time, and now it has almost uh, one, thor one fourth of common Lisp standard in terms of symbols. Uh, but at the same time, it's uh, so I took a somewhat radical approach. So, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, retaining backward compatibility, I still uh, wanted to like, experiment with things that uh, you want to have from other languages. Uh, like, uh, someone wants to have. Uh, Python style generator, someone might, might want to have generic element uh, access, someone might want to have uh, short lambda, uh, form for lambdas like uh, closure uh, once. And so in this, uh, in this code example, I have shown some of the things uh, you may recognize. Uh, hopefully, you, you should recognize what all of them do without uh, looking at, the, at their definition. Uh, and so this uh, collection of, uh, of utilities. Um, has a lot of stuff in it. It has, uh, you can see here, a destruction unified bind operation, which is uh, like extensible code with. Uh, it has a lot of just simple utilities that you would encounter everywhere. It has uh, different syntactic things uh, using uh, named tables library. Uh, so 
uh, it also has a lot of aliasing of common uh, LISP operations and stuff like that. Uh, and so the point is that actually, uh, like incrementally implementing all these things, uh, you might arrive at a language that is, uh, so to say, uh, very similar to things t people would expect, modern things, so to say. Uh, so you can use it, and now uh, you can use, you can even par use parts of it if you want because it's modular. And you can try to uh, use the same ideas if you like some of these ideas. And now, uh, actually, no one has an excuse to say that uh, okay, these things are done much more clean, cleanly uh, in some language because you, can, you might, almost all of them you, uh, at the level of syntax and basic operations you might have in common Lisp just using these things. So thanks. This thing's on. Uh, you hear me? Yeah, good. So uh, the bad thing is uh, I came uh, over here to rent. All us uh, common lispers know this CL, uh, the CLHS, the common lisp hyper spec, right? It is a very good sturdy piece of uh, documentation that served all of us lispers well, but unfortunately it, closed. It, it, it is closed. It is not extensible. And it, it has this looks like uh, as if it was made uh, in the 90s, right? Because, uh, well, it was. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, it lacks a, a few of the features uh, that uh, it would be handy to have, like it is a, com it is a completely static we uh, website. The best uh, uh, things that we made to search it uh, are currently I uh, IRC bots uh, on the channel, uh, the best things uh, that I know. Even Google itself, when I search for this thing, it doesn't uh, do the, the best thing like uh, giving me the first search. It's totally, it's totally decent at it, but actually it's not as good as I'd, as I'd li uh, like it to be. There's that uh, one thing, uh, well, CLHS, okay, there's the ANSI itself, right? The standard or organization, like I could buy the, the standard myself, right? And I will get a very good uh, uh, selectable document, not some uh, poorly scanned printout of the original paper, right? Well, the, a few people before me made a mistake of buying the original, which looks like this, which is very sad. Uh, cut, uh, cut out over here, holes over here, and uh, skew lines over there. It is not a very good file. And uh, the ANSI uh, page says, uh, says explicitly no refunds. Well, there are modern uh, documentations. It's new, it's fresh, it's, it's generated daily. It's uh, balkanized as uh, the Lisp community itself. So if you wanted to grab just Lisp documentation, you don't download it. You have to aggregate over uh, 50 different uh, web pages at different addresses, uh, uh, strange ports, just to get uh, the majority of the Lisp documentation. <sighs> okay. I'm better now, thanks. <laughs> yeah, uh, just one more thing. Uh, now I'm able to talk about uh, what I want to, uh, to do with it. Because I started a project that I call the ultra spec. Uh, the first thing, it is not based on the hyper spec in any way because it's copyrighted, I cannot uh, use it. But there is a draft of the common Lisp standard, uh, the, th the third draft that contains, uh, from what I hear, the same content, but, this is, uh, but it was released under public domain, so I can utilize it. A sample piece of uh, code from it, because it is uh, proper LaTeX, uh, I was able to parse it with uh, uh, some basic regex uh, into wiki markup, and I was able to render it uh, on my own in such a way, goddamn the resolution, but, uh, well, uh, it is uh, searchable. Uh, it, uh, okay, uh, in a moment, uh, the live demo is over here. Thanks, Shinmera. Uh, basically, what I want it to be, uh, it's uh, an, I want it to be editable. I want it to be community-based. So if you want uh, to submit uh, some sort of uh, 
clarification. There are lots of uh, places in the standard that uh, things need to be clarified. You can just upload it. I want it to be as complete as possible, uh, possibly having uh, unifying libraries from all over the common le le lesb universe to at least to try to end the balkanization. And I want it to be versioned, I want it to be forkable, uh, and I want, to be, uh, I want it to be modular. So if you want to like uh, develop uh, or report uh, or insert actually uh, the documentation of your own library, it should be as easy as uh, inserting a single uh, the, uh, directory in the tree of directories and you're done. It's already there. Uh, and uh, right now, oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if, uh, if, uh, if you want the, to get the link, uh, the proper link itself is on the, yeah, uh, uh, the, the, the slides are on the w website. They're already on the website. Yeah, so they're there. Thanks. Up next. Uh, hi. My name is... Phil Gagne, and I've been lisping a long time, uh, starting in about 1966 at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Laboratory with LISP 1.5. Um, um, and if you think the documentation on common LISP is bad, <laughs> anyway, uh, OK. So what I'm going to talk about are two things. First, I'm going to talk about the, the talk that I really wanted to give, which is why we should be replacing politicians with intelligent machines, and how we could, okay, um, and how we could go about that. C can't give that talk, unfortunately, today. Uh, what I can do is talk about Prisma, which is a project that we are doing, and we is the um, um, school consulting group, and it's being done with Thomson Reuters. Thomson Reuters happens to be the largest data depository in the world outside governments. It's huge. They've been acquiring companies for the past oh, 20 years, uh, and they have huge amounts of data which they're making accessible via an API, via a technology they call Electron. Oh, and the dragon. Um, why do my slides have two dragons? Because I couldn't find any raccoons. So icon. This is a typical icon page. You can tell that it's kind of unfortunate. The users who are principally banks and central banks, big insurance companies, governments, can kind of design their own pages and drag things around. ICON presents electron data. It presents only a small amount of it, and it doesn't present it very well. So what we want to do is inject AI into ICON. So we're doing that now. And why else the dragon? Because we're doing it in Bucharest. As you may know, the dragon is one of the symbols of Romania. So we're doing it in, unfortunately, in JavaScript, because we have no choice. We're doing it in C Sharp and ASP and .NET, unfortunately, because we have no choice. And of course, um, Lisp is going to handle all the hard stuff. All right, ICON currently is a financial analyst tool. We view it differently. We view it as a platform to distribute political economical analysis. As a company, we've been doing, and I've been doing, political and economic analysis for the past um, four or five years, or 
customers have been primarily governments. Thomson Reuters is interested in expanding ICON. They have 300,000 subscribers worldwide. They figure we can pick up about 80,000 in year one. We believe that. We want to go dramatically beyond what they are now doing. We want to take the human analysis that we're now doing and replace it with um, robots. That's what we're doing, and we're doing it in Lisp. We're doing it in Bucharest. It's a fantastic place. Anyone who wants to know more about it, talk to Laura, who's the woman with the sneakers that she swears to me are not pink. Um, so Romania is a country whose debt is shrinking as a percentage of GDP, that makes it in the vast minority. The cost of living there is excellent. Uh, it's situated between the Middle East and Europe, which is one of the reasons we picked it. Now, one point of interest, which is that Romania built a Lisp um, machine years ago. At the same time, people at MIT and DEC uh, we're trying to build a Lisp machine, and they did it independently. That was Professor Stefan. Here is his paper. Um, he succeeded. The people at MIT succeeded. We're now hiring Lisp programmers. Come, come talk to me. So there, there was a, there was a, a lightning talk yesterday where um, one was um, told about problems that come up when one wants to have uh, different versions of things, and that one might might actually uh, put things in different packages. I want to talk about what happens, what one can actually do with that in a real place. Mike, okay. I want to talk about what one can do using that in a real case. The, the query processor that I showed you before is written with a, uh, um, based on BNFs that are put out by the W3C. They have evolved over time. So you have here version for Sparkle 1.0. There is a Sparkle 1.1. If you can read BNFs fast enough, you'll see that some of the productions have changed between them. The query processor that you saw has evolved over time and has done all these things over time. It's, we've been doing this now for about four years. If you have a query like this, it, it's, it is implemented by having a processor which takes the BNF, turns the BNF into an augmented transition net and compiles the augmented transition net into Lisp directly. In order to do that, you have symbols. Symbols have to be in certain packages. How does this system run if the generated code has changed over time? In particular, if a production changes, it means it's the signature of the constructor for the production changes. I do that by having things living in different, that's the parser, Where is 
Here is what gets produced as a syntax, as a, as a the, the, the syntax tree gets, gets translated directly into Lisp code that gets compiled and run. So there's no chance to change any of, of this. It happens directly, effectively from the BNF. There are two BNFs, for example. This is You'll see that one of the productions got an extra clause. That means that there's a constructor function that changed. Put them in different packages. They can both exist at the same time. The, the system that's running, this system here, actually has both of those parsers in it. I don't do different releases. I do patches. So if you look at this is a patch list for that running code. The last patch, that, the second to last patch that went in was for a revision clause. That's an addition to the BNF to change it so that in addition to the standard Sparkle clauses, I added a clause. That means that the BNF changes, that means that the production function changes, that means the signature changes. I have to have that function lying around with all of the other functions that do the rest of the BNF and have them work at the same time. That's done by putting each of these in its own package and paying attention to the fact that shadow is your friend. You can take a package that's running, all of the code is still there, shadow some of the symbols, introduce a new package that has just those symbols changes, just those operators change, and have the new code that you're putting in use those operators in the new package, but have the package inherit all the symbols from the old package, and those don't change. So this is, this is a more radical version of, of replacing your packages. You can selectively, surgically change the symbols that are present in your runtime in order to accommodate the changes you need to make. Graphics cards and Linux and Lisp. What could go wrong? Right. Let's hold the mic. Not no. One second. Oh. Right. There should be. Oh, there he is. He's upside down, but we can work with it. Come to me. There. Right. I can't place nervously up and down when I'm holding this thing. Okay. So here I'm. I'm baggers. I'm talking about Keppel, the project I work on. It's uh, Lispy abstractions over OpenGL. Uh, last year, I talked briefly about it, showing how you can upload and download data from the GPU really easily. You can write uh, your shaders in Lisp and have them cross-compiled uh, into GLSL code that just runs. You can update everything live. It's been getting more stable in the last year. I've been doing a ton of work, especially in the last month, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. So yeah, last year I showed some graphics, and this year I'm showing much worse graphics, so that's progress. Um, what I actually want to talk about is I've been really focusing on getting this thing documented and ready for something like a beta. Now, this isn't your kind of Google fashionable beta. This is a classic beta with bugs and features that aren't finished. Um, but it's in a place, yes, it's in a place where people can play with it. The stuff that's there is not going away. But what is there works. And yeah, like stuff like this. This is a million and something particles. It's not pushing this GPU at all. This is a six-year-old laptop. This is really simple stuff, and we can do this from Lisp. It's really fast, and there's tons of room for optimization in Kevl. And part of the reason it's running so slow is because of this damn projector and stuff, because that's, that's running on 60 frames a second elsewhere. But anyway, come play. Come talk to me. Tell me what's wrong, and uh, we'll make loads of cool GPU stuff. Thank you very much. I'll take turbo questions if anyone's got time. <coughs> Have I got time? Three minutes. Three minutes. Go. Fast questions. Tim Moore? No, not so much. I, I was uh, talking to him about some of our stuff and whether some of it overlapped. But uh, yeah, he's got a much more classy approach. But I'd love to come down and talk to him. And, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, works on SBCL, uh, ECL, and CCL so far. Please test more. I only needed three to get into Quick Lisp, so. Uh, all of them. Yes, Vario is a separate library, takes Lisp S expressions and gives you GLSL code and metadata. Any more for any more? Looks like it. Cool. Thank you very much. You actually have one more question. Uh, yeah. Take it. Come on. Uh, can I find you on, uh, on the IOC anywhere? Yeah, I'm on those games a lot. And yeah, my email is on GitHub. Okay. Yep. Yeah, Mihai. Start talking then. Uh, <clears throat> I am. A, a oh, wait, wait, wait. What? Okay, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I am here to, to, to present my favorite pet project, uh, which is uh, <clears throat> a query FS. Uh, oh, right. Uh, yes. I, I will again talk about my f favorite pet project, which is query FS, which is virtual file system for integrating stuff. Uh, we <clears throat> So, the, looking back, uh, look, looking back at some uh, at some point, I used some fun uh, f special file systems which try to represent some database state onto the virtual file system, and it was not exactly what I wanted. And then Microsoft announced WinFS, which would provide persistent searches as a, a full compatible directories, and I wanted to look what the interface would be. And then they, of course, didn't ship anything. And uh, that's exactly how it goes all the time. And uh, so, uh, but I'm using Linux anyway. What I do is should be portable to Mac, but I don't know because I haven't had a Mac in my life. Uh, so I'm, I'm willing to work together with people to try it, whether it is easy to port. Uh, and so the baby steps were uh, to provide stuff like that. It's a DSL to describe a virtual file system. You can actually go to this file system, open files with your ed text editor, especially if it's not Emacs, because with Emacs you want to do it another way anyway. It, you can actually open fi uh, files and attach them to emails in your browser or somewhat, or whatever. You don't need any special support in the programs. And this, uh, this is just an hierarchical structure which describes uh, the, the code, uh, how to get the list of packages, list of symbols of packages. You can just get a file system like CD queries list of first. And have an actual list, list of directories which are actually packages and go into a package and see the list of symbols. Can I? Yes. Uh, and so, and then enter the symbol and read its description, if, if there is any. Yeah, contents. Well, no contents, oh, but oh well. Uh, <laughs> it's not about special internals. Uh, and so, yeah, that is what, I, what was the baby penguin, and next step is, uh, 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 yeah, uh, the next step is uh, something more complicated. It is a DSL to describe synt uh, syntaxes, which is actually just comment pack. Uh, I mean the parser expression grammars. This is how I describe stuff. Uh, this is how I do uh, the SQL backed tagging of files, uh, which are era, the tags are hierarchical, and then you can just go there and see the f and get the links to the files. Uh, which uh, <coughs> this is uh, real, the real parts of real queries, and as you can see, uh, there are actual SQL queries with some minimal scaffolding around them, and this really works. And now, 
uh, the stage is uh, um, the penguin has grown up and looking for f further directions. Uh, I mean that I use this for some stuff and I want it to be useful for more people. Uh, and I'm not sure to which people and how to be useful to, for more people. I, I actually h have already some suggestions from some person, thank you, uh, but I want more suggestions. Yeah, uh, this is a rare case where an open source project maintainer says that feature requests have larger than a half chance of actually being implemented by the existing maintainer and not getting a reply like patches welcome because I really want suggestions for new features and what are the priorities to build out because I do depend on this project for my email processing so I will keep using it myself. It won't go anywhere but you can ask for new features and have a good chance of actually getting them. This is CLFUS project, which is bindings, and then there is QueryFS inside CLFS project on CLNet, or you can search for QueryFS, or you can email me, or whatever. Second, I need to fix. One more moment. Uh, screens. If this one doesn't work, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, uh, Shall I push the button? Uh, not yet. Oh, yeah, it yeah, works. It works. So yeah, uh, you hear me? Yeah. Uh, what I will be doing here is actually, uh, the story goes like this. Uh, I actually met a person on the IRC channel like uh, Sunday afternoon. They posted one very interested project and I said, uh, hey, perhaps I could present it at the ALS because it sounds interesting to me, might be interesting to other people. They said, okay, after three, uh, after three hours, send me a, a video. So, well, it's like, is this? Uh, yeah. And uh, what it is, uh, is actually, I might go a little bit uh, over time and get shot, but... Uh, <laughs> I don't know the video because... Uh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, this, this, uh, you see all of it. Yeah, you see all of it. Hello. Lisp C is a flavor of C that compiles to C. It can be seen as this raw structure of C made visible through the syntax of Lisp, but it is much more than that. A lot of people argue that well written Lisp can be fast as C. A lot of other people argue that poorly or average written C code can be as slow as Lisp. While I think both points have their merits, I decided that I wanted the best of both worlds, and that a lot of other people might too. Lisp is a very useful language for prototyping, and C is a very useful language when you want something done quickly. What I envisioned was simple, the marriage of C and Lisp. Lisp, as I have said before, is a very useful prototyping language, especially when the end is not yet in sight. Its macros are the best part, arguably, of the whole language. That, and it does not hide its syntax tree. I envision Lisp C partially as a prototyping language that one might use as startup projects like Perl, Python, Ruby, and other such tools. Lisp C is a useful standalone language because any program that is written C can be written in Lisp C in a manner which is virtually identical. The output code is predictable and efficient as a programmer wants it to be. 
Lisp macros and templates are one of the biggest innovations that I added to C with Lisp C. Lisp macros are code that writes code, and now C uses that functionality too. Functions that are used on Lisp C are just functions with the same name with dash C attached to them. There are a lot of strange details like this. They can be changed in the future. The main question is, is it powerful? I believe it is. I had fun writing a lot of different code in Lisp C and found myself using a lot less code repetition. I enjoyed using it and I believe that you will too. You can use Lisp C anywhere that you use C. It's just an interlanguage compiler that runs currently from C Lisp, although that functionality will be extended to other flavors of Lisp in the future. In the future, I would like Lisp C to incorporate C++ to be used as a standalone tool to be targeted to even other languages such as Python and Ruby, and to be a lot more than the 800 odd lines of code that it is now. I think that there's a lot of potential for Lisp C, and I think that with your help, we can realize that potential. Uh, afterwards, okay? Yeah. Uh, so, uh... <laughs> yeah. Uh... <laughs> So basically, uh, the examples that are on GitHub, uh, I have a screens of these. Uh, actually, the first uh, full screen, yeah, it works. Uh, a little uh, code snippet like this gets translated uh, the, after a so-called uh, cleanup uh, to this. Uh, there are more complicated things that I forgot my notebook. Well, uh, there is like uh, templating uh, in simple C. Uh, someone wa might uh, write uh, a tons of uh, little functions like this, but someone might use the uh, templating included in the Lisp C and just uh, write things li like this for different uh, types of arguments. Later on, there are classes uh, that are written in p uh, pure C. There are just the structs, but with this uh, simple macro, someone can class, uh, well, it's uh, very similar to dev class from uh, the CLOS. And uh, this is much more complicated, but th th this is actually the worst kind of class I've ever seen in C++ because it contains absolutely everything. And uh, this guy supposedly uh, made it uh, writable in uh, Lisp. Well, uh, much more parentheses, uh, much less uh, weird uh, C, uh, C symbols, but uh, uh, it works. I didn't build it, build it myself because I don't do C-Lisp, but, but uh, well, it's uh, Jonathan uh, Baca, so, uh, well, I'm not the person, he's uh, the one who wrote it, and I'm just presenting it on his behalf. Uh, it supports multi-threading uh, uh, by p-threads. It has uh, built-in uh, CUDA implementation, a me a message pa passing interface, uh, interface, templates for both C and C++, and uh, C++ that is a work in progress. So, yeah, that's all. Microphone. Hello, microphone. I was hoping to give a different talk to announce that uh, the Lambda operating system version 130 was now available for use. It's not. Um, there are still a few bugs in the system. This uh, was the most advanced development system in the middle 80s. Are we there yet? But I can show you a screenshot. Um, showing the emulator crashing. And there it is. You can see that there are a little a few glitches in the screen as well. And we think the arithmetic logic unit has some uh, problems also. So instead, I'm talking about electricity is orange. This is actually the name of a talk I attended in 1984 at Columbia University Video Games Day. A fellow named Warren Robinette developed a robot game. Now here you have a controller for a robot. Here's a sensor and you see the electricity is orange because 
the touch sensor is detecting that the robot is bumping into something. And here you see the controller responding by actuating a thruster, causing it to move away from that something. This is a game. It inspired an entire generation of hackers and electronics designers and so on. And I intend to follow in the footsteps, except in three dimensions, maybe using that wonderful uh, lispy graphic stuff. Now, this is electronic brain one. It's got a microcontroller, an AT Tiny 83. The thing costs less than a nickel. It's got uh, 512 bytes of RAM and 8K bytes of flash, and you program it using this USB interface. The idea is little kids can just stick this on their electric car and start programming it. That is nice if you actually have one. I'm thinking everybody's got a phone, it's got a GPU. I want to make a three-dimensional model of logic circuits and all that good stuff so that anybody who has a phone can play a game based on this good old game from back in the day. So I've been splitting my time between Hong Kong and Shenzhen, where these are very easy and cheap to make. And I'm going to give you a, a quick walk through the, uh, the old game. You go to archive.org, and guess what? You can play the game. Here are a couple of robots. It looks like the game has crashed. They're not actually running. Well, that's what happens when you uh, have a live demo. Does anyone see my mouse? Okay. Oh, well, no demo. I was going to walk inside the robot, show you how to rewire it with your mousy soldering iron, and change its behavior. Likewise, you get chips, NAND gates, OR gates, all that good stuff, and you can see the electricity. It is orange. Real electricity, it's really hard to see, even when you have LEDs. But in this imaginary world, you can do that. Ah, uh, can't play the game. That's terrible. 55 seconds. Well, I could go back and uh, reload. Where is the... Uh, I can't quite see anything. Is that the reload button? No, it's some other button. So, restart the emulation. So this will require graphics hacking. I'm hoping to use Scheme or Lisp um, to drive WebGL or something like that. Anybody who's interested in playing with this, it'll be a serious... So here you see some lot familiar-looking logic gates, and you see it's got top and bottom touch sensors, top and bottom thrusters. It goes, hits the top, reverses the thrust, goes down, hits the bottom, goes back up again. And there is... Uh, various other NEATO sensors. So to progress in the game, you actually have to become a digital logic designer. And if you think this is incredibly brilliant, then um, help me make this thing. <laughs>